Hello, my name is Keith Bomer. I'm a military historian here at the Okanagan Military Museum. Today I want to talk to you about our trophy gun and what its value is to our community. Since installing our refurbished World War I German field gun in 2016, we put it on display out in front of our museum. And in the course of our studies, we determined that what unit had captured it, what action this gun had been used in, and more importantly, we linked it to one of the names on our cenotaph who lost his life in that same action, in the actual capturing of this gun. So we're going to be talking about the connection between James Favell, the 7th Battalion BC Regiment, and the German field gun. Now Favell came from the Okanagan, on his attestation papers, which are found at Library and Archives Canada, it lists him off as living in South Okanagan. He had a sister as his next of kin. He was single, 24 years of age when he enlisted in March of 1917. He was five feet, six and a half inches tall. He had a dark complexion, brown eyes and black hair, and he belonged to the Roman Catholic faith. He was medically examined for fitness by Dr. Boyce, who was an important uh, physician in the Okanagan Valley, uh, later served as a magistrate here in Kelowna and other community uh, functions like that. The 7th Battalion, 1st BC Regiment, was formed in, in Valcartier, Quebec in 1914, and it enrolled 1176 men and 47 officers in the unit. It went over to France uh, after passing through England for further training and was involved in many of the, the battles that went on over there. It drew reinforcements from Victoria, Vancouver, New West and Kamloops and many of the men that ended up in that unit were trained in our camp in Camp Vernon. James Favell was trained in, in Vernon, made his way to England, came down with the mumps, bronchitis, appendicitis, and had some dental work done while he was in England, before he even got over to the frontline areas. He had volunteered for service in France in 1917, at a time when the Military Service Act was coming into effect, and men were registered uh, for potential conscription into uniform, because volunteering numbers had dropped off significantly in those years. James also had two elder brothers. Both came from Kelowna. Both were enlisted in the 172nd Battalion Rocky Mountain Rangers, who also went overseas and filled the ranks of other uh, BC units. So we'll pick up the story of James in a little bit, but let's talk about the gun itself. The gun had a crew of five to eight people. It was pulled by, by horses, so it had a second carriage to it called a limber that was connected to it, and the men would ride in different positions uh, on the horses or on the guns themselves. It fired one of many types of uh, munitions. Different types of guns fired were of different sizes, and some of these munitions had nicknames. When you got into frontline areas, you started to identify what was the threats in your environment. And a whole language was started about how to identify these things. Something that flew slow and, and made a whooshing sound would have a certain name to it. So there are things like woolly bears and coal boxes that when it exploded would make a big cloud of black smoke, just like coal does. Or in the case of our gun, the whiz bang. Now, what's the difference between a gun and a howitzer? Well, a gun is more like a tennis ball. A howitzer is more like a golf ball. They're launching devices to throw a bomb out a certain distance on a certain flight path. A howitzer is designed to throw, lob the shell up and down onto its target, whereas a gun was a faster velocity projectile that flew on a fairly flat flight path from A to B, from the gun muzzle to its target. So it's like 
uh, the difference between teeing off on a golf course, lobbing your golf ball down onto the green hundreds of yards away versus serving with a tennis ball and getting it to zip over the top of the net and land somewhere in the other guy's court where he didn't reach it. A very flat and very fast sort of flight path. So how did the guns get captured? The Canadians were operating in France in 1918. Most of the action that we're talking about occurs in September. So this is after the Germans had expended their effort with the spring offensive in March and April of 1918 and were now on the back foot. They were now overstretched in their logistics and their manpower and Canadians were now being plugged into the line becoming become the point of the spear of the British Army pushing the Germans back towards Germany. The area that we're discussing, the battle that we're discussing, was something called the DQ line. DQ, what's that? Dairy Queen? No. The DQ was, line was a, a series of strong defensive positions that the Germans had built that they fell back onto, and it was one of the last lines of defense before the German border. It was still in France, but if we could break that line, it would be a free game all the way to the German border. The action was called the Battle of Arras. It involved all four Canadian divisions, and we were advancing down the road uh, between Arras and Cambrai, leading up to a series of other actions like the Canal du Nord and the Battle of Valenciennes. We have an example of the battlefield map of the day, the red being the trench lines and railway lines and so on, and it gives you a little bit of an idea of what the topography and the challenges were. A year and a half after enlisting, James Fabel was found in the 1st Company of the 7th Battalion in France, in front of the DQ line. Lieutenant A.B. Morco was the commanding officer of that company, and he writes in the after action report in the unit's war diary for the month of uh, September. At 5 a.m., under the cover of a barrage, we advanced on enemy positions. We were greeted by machine gun fire, which lasted until entering the front line of the DQ line. Just before entering the line, we were joined by the tanks, and from that time on, they were largely instrumental in clearing of isolated MG positions. Prisoners were taken, and under cover of the barrage, the company was reorganized. We then advanced on the support line, inflicting many casualties on the retreating enemy. Heavy machine gun fire was opened from the support line, but this was silenced by our Lewis guns and concentrated rifle fire, and the advance continued. Large numbers of the enemy given themselves up along the way. From here to the objective, enemy machine gun posts were strung along the slight rise of ground, and many posts were captured to, around the Boise switch area. McCorgo goes on, on reaching our objective, the enemy opened on us with field guns at point blank range. From just in front of the wood at grid Victor 3 Bravo, map reference for the Villiers Le Cagnecourt in France. The concentrated fire was opened and the guns silenced and 40 of the enemy surrendered. Our trophy gun was one of two guns captured by the 7th Battalion that day in this action. However, James Cavell was killed that day. His circumstances of death notes Killed in action while advancing with his company in an attack on the Jocourt Guyant line south of the Arras and Cambrai Road towards Villiers le Cagnacourt. He was instantly killed by the explosion of an enemy shell. Others that were killed that day from the Okanagan included Private C.O. Needham of, Pen of Peachland, Lieutenant T.R. Broad of Summerland, Corporal H. England of Penticton. Private H. E. Cooper of Penticton. Dying of wounds later on was Private J. Kincaid of Kelowna. Now these fellows were not necessarily in the 7th Battalion, but they were in that part of the front line doing their part that also suffered in that action. The newspaper clipping that came out announcing his passing was headlined, Killed in action on the 2nd of September, Private James Favell, a native son of Kelowna, gives his life. Favelle, who was well known both here in Okanagan Mission, was born at Kelowna. He was brother 
to Mrs. Fred Small of Kelowna Mission and was 25 years of age as of the 22nd of February last. And he is listed on our cenotaph. So the gun was captured by the unit at the price of many soldiers' lives. What became of it? Many of these trophies were gathered in a, in a field and catalogued and registered and marked to indicate what unit had captured what machine gun, what trench mortar, what field gun, what howitzer, etc. Some of them became trophies associated with Victoria Cross winners. Others were allocated for general distribution across Canada. And they were put in, recorded into various ledgers that are now available at Library and Archives Canada. Trophy guns were used as a way to generate funds for the war effort through war bonds and victory loans and so on. And so this was a, an advertisement in the Summerland newspaper, Wheel Your District Win This Gun, and it shows a 77mm Krupp uh, field gun like ours. Kelowna got their gun as announced in the Kelowna record of Thursday, July 29th, 1920. German field gun presented to Kelowna. The mayor receives notification of shipment of war trophy that was brought in uh, by rail car at a weight of 5,000 pounds, came in on July 14th, and will be accepted and put on display in City Park. And there it was for many, many uh, decades until eventually being moved over to the British Company of Goons Armors on the corner of Lawrence Ave and Richter Street. It had also been, when it was in City Park, it was also adjacent to the Cenotaph, which had these battle stones around it. So leading up to uh, the anniversary of uh, the First World War, the centennial of the First World War, the Okanagan Military Museum Society, the Kelowna Museums, and other partners like the City of Kelowna uh, removed the gun from the lawn of the armories and restored it in a shop, repainting it, redoing some of the woodwork on the seats and the spokes, and putting it out on display with the battle honor stones uh, surrounding it to make a fitting tribute in front of the Okanagan Military Museum. So in the course of our research, we were able to determine what unit captured it what action was this gun involved in? And who paid the price to uh, capture this trophy that we could have on display back in Canada? Trophies were another way of disarming the German army in the 1920s as well. So, to wrap things up, we have Private James Favell from Kelowna with his 7th Battalion involved in action to capture a field gun that probably very well may have killed him and having it displayed here in front of the Okanagan Military Museum. I hope you've enjoyed this and I thank you for your interest and we'll see you next time.